All right, everyone, welcome to the 11 a.m. presentation by Ashraf Sami Higab on how to create your own multiplayer games. Please enjoy and give him a warm welcome, everybody. Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, that guy can hear me, that's good. We're going to get some projector on the screen and we're going to be awesome together. Can I just ask, has anyone here actually tried making their own game before? Okay, tell me about it. What platform did you make it on? No? Sorry? Mobile. That's good. PC. Okay, who wants to shout out their game so we can all download it? Come on! <laughs> Alright, so today, it's, it's aimed for beginners, but the stuff we're going to be introducing you is going to be very, very hardcore, but we're going to try making it as simple as possible. We're going to be introducing you multiplayer servers, basic over overview of architectures to set up there. We're going to be introducing you how to make a game in a browser, but not just any normal game. We're going to be showing you how to make it 3D. Has anyone done any 3D stuff before? Okay, we've got a couple, so we're going to reiterate that, and we're going to put a couple of game loops. The good thing about this, even if you don't get it this time around, if you go ahead and try making a, a game yourself, it might be clearer the next time around you go around to it. So my name is Ashraf Sami Higab, which is actually Arabic for the most honorable headscarf. I've been working in the games industry for about seven years. Worked in a studio in Birmingham. We did um, Xbox 360 games, PS3 games. We did a 50 cent game. Okay, and a BAFTA award winning game. <laughs> I left that. I spent three years doing mobile R&D. And now I, I've done my own, I'm doing my own startup. And it's, again, in game development, behind, but tools behind it. So um, it should be fun. Going to brain dump all our knowledge. Kind of stuff that I'm doing at the moment. I'm really, really in love with making things multi-platform, making things work on the web, on mobile, on consoles, seamlessly, one code base. That's my passion. And hopefully you'll get some of that from it as well because it's amazing how many different platforms there are right now. And they're all extenuate, accentuating each of our consumer base. But the hard thing about it is you need to learn separate APIs. Like if you learn the Windows 8 API, it's great. You can use Windows Phone 8, but you can't do Firefox OS. You need to learn a new system. Our ideal use case is we're all Kate. Any females here? Yes, we've got some females. That's good. And we wish we can make our own games. So we're going to go into 3D. We're going to talk about WebGL. We're going to talk about basic stuff like how do you draw a cube and how would you go in to do that? We're going to talk about movement, collision detection, some really basic collision detection to get your character moving on the screen. And then going multiplayer, we're going to talk a little about what web sockets are. You're probably going to get bored of that, but you're going to get an idea of the architectures behind it and going forward into the future, what you can do with this awesome stuff. So guys, I'm going to ask you, has anyone here ever heard of HTML5? You know, when it came into free fruition three years ago, everyone was like saying, it's too slow, it's rubbish. And then like a year later, all the business devs in the company that I worked with before, they were like, HTML5, we're going to make an application. What are you going to use? HTML5. If you said HTML5, they'll give you money. So now it's an insanely huge buzzword. But um, there's something that HTML5 gives you, and it's an API called WebGL. WebGL just means, actually, does anyone know what WebGL means? Oh, we got this guy. Shout out. Go. Dude, you win a t-shirt. Except I'm wearing it, so we're going to have to go to the toilet and exchange. <laughs> the great thing about WebGL is, if you learn WebGL, it works on BlackBerry. Yay! Tizen, what's that? It's amazing. <laughs> Firefox, Ubuntu, Internet Explorer, the latest one now actually supports it, so you can make Windows Phone apps in the future from it. Chrome OS supports it. Android supports it. And Safari, yeah, that's right. Safari actually supports it, but only if you're making adverts. You have to use a private API to get it through. But it shows signs that in a couple of years or a year or so, you make one app in WebGL and you can run it everywhere. I'm going to slow it down now. I'm going to tidy up the entertainment. I'm just going to make it very simple. And in the world of graphics, 3D graphics, everything is a triangle. It never used to be, like 10 years ago there was quads, but as of OpenGL ES, they stripped out all the other formats and they just kept it to triangles. And the thing that you're going to see with triangles is there's something called vertices, UVs, indices, and normals. 
I'm just going to say what they each are. A vertex just defines a point in space. So that top one is 0x, 1y, that means it's up there, and 0z, so it's not forward, it's here, it's here. So you can specify any point in the world as a vertex. UV, if you ever want to draw an image on top of that vertex, there's this thing called UVs, and all that specifies is the texture space mapping. Now, texture space mapping sounds like something very complicated and something out of Star Trek, maybe if you're hearing it for the first time. But all it is is just, imagine this is 0, 0, and this is 1, 1. 0, 0 will be the bottom left of the texture. 1, 1 will be the top right of the texture. And it will automatically interpret the texture onto whatever position the triangle is. So if I have this triangle here, and I've texture mapped it around here. If I spin it around, the texture will still be around it. If you know this before, it'll be easy. But if you haven't heard it before, don't worry. It's going to get easy. Indices, you don't need to worry about that. It's just a way to optimize how you're going to draw things. Rather than just always saying, go around in here in these circles, you can just say, use this point, use that point, use that point. But don't worry too much about it. Normals, you don't, again, need to worry too much about it. And you can totally forget about it. But if you get into the world of lighting, all a normal is just specifies which direction the light is going to bounce. So I'm standing here. There's a light source coming from, from this direction. So my normal is this way. But if it gets to a more complicated image like my face, normals are going to be pointing all the way around. And that's how you see things. So normal defines what way the light would point. And the vertex is where you are. And the UVs is just texture map. Now, I'm really sorry to be dumping all this on you. I know game devs is really, really fun. But just hang on with me, because it's going to get easier. Because we're going to be showing you how to draw a cube. And I'm going to be, yeah? Did we get a yeah? What? S again, stand up. Sit down. Give me 50 press-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take you to a website called Learning WebGL. Now, this stuff is the hardest core layer you'd ever learn in graphics. You won't have to do this in real life unless you want to get into the world of engine development. But there's this amazing website. It's called Learning WebGL. And they have this section called Lessons. And step by step, they show you how to initialize the scene, how to draw a triangle, how to add color, adding a bit of movement, making it 3D, adding a texture, handling keyboard input, and it goes on and on and on. The great thing about this, it's all open source and it's all on GitHub. And they have so much good documentation. Bad thing about it is, I don't have internet connectivity, so I'm running off my local server. But I'm just going to go through some of the demos that it gives you. So here, it's drawing a, tri a colored triangle and a square. The next lesson is making it spin. Again, now it's spinning in three-dimensional space. Now it's going to be textured. And here you have some movement. I'm going to jump into the last one to just show you how awesome you'll get if you go through these, these steps. And I'm going to go through these steps with you. I'm going to pick out lesson number six. And this guy over here, when I'm pressing the right keyboard, he spins right. And when I press the left keyboard, he spins left. So you pretty much got a game right there to build from. What I'm going to do in this demo, I'm just going to show you how the drawing works. Now, I'm really sorry to be showing code. Very, very sorry. But we're going to break it down. It's going to be really easy. Trust me. It's going to be the, the easiest code you've ever seen in your life. If you haven't ever looked at code in your life before. <laughs> the function that I'm going to go into is called draw scene. Now, this file, it's, it's, it seems pretty big. But there's only one function that you should be looking at if you want to get into the whole drawing thing. And it's just very small. It just fills up one screen. I'm just going to go for it line by line and just dump what it says. The first one, this one is called GL Viewport. And all that does is just specify where the graphics is going to be drawn from. So it says from 0, 0 to the viewport width, to the height. So just saying, use the entire screen. The next one says clear. It clears the screen to black. There's something called matrices in the world of 3D graphics. 
don't worry too much about it. If Neo is not going to jump out of you, there is no Agent Smith. It's nothing complicated. You don't need to even need to learn maths because it's all handled for you. But this function called perspective, all it says is just give me a 3D visualization. And it's saying make it at the field of view of 45 degrees. So in 2D space, it's at infinite plane, so you see everything flat. But in 3D, you can only see a certain angle. Don't worry too much about it, but then it gets really easy, yeah? First, you give something called an identity matrix, and all an identity ma matrix means is zero. So this is going to be the origin of the world, just zero. And here, what we're doing is we're translating that matrix to an X position, a Y position, and a Z position. And then we're rotating it around the X and the Y. So going back to the demo, this is spinning around the X and the Y, all because this value X rot and Y rot is being changed. So if I, if I search for X rot and Y rot, it's modified by something called X speed. And all it does in this function called handle keys, if you have the left key press, it decrements that speed by minus one. It's not complicated, hopefully. I'm gonna finish it off, very, very simple. This block just binds the cube position buffer. All the cube position buffer contains is just a series of points in the world. This line says, use a texture. And this line says, draw elements, and it draws it. I'm going to stop because it sounds scary. Someone wants to take a picture. You can take a picture. But it's open source. It's, it's not going to run away. Going to jump into that same function again. We're just going to go for it one more time. You're never going to have to see this again in your life. The first bit just sets up the view. The second bit positions whatever you're going to draw and rotates it. The next bit just sets the buffers. What are you going to be drawing? Next bit after that is use this texture. The last bit just draws. Now, play around with this, have fun with this, because if you can master this, you can do anything in the history of the hashtag world in 3D graphics. That's all it is. You just say where you want to put it, what buffers you want to use, what textures you want to use, and how to draw it. Deep breaths. Okay. I'm going to... Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work, because um, I'm not on the internet, but I'm going to try it. Uh... Fingers crossed, guys. Okay, we got something. Hopefully, it's going to do something. All right, unfortunately, I'm not going to show you this demo because the internet isn't working right now. But what you would have seen is just a really basic implementation just using the API, playing this game, and you've got 3D graphics. Right now, next thing I'm going to go into is movement. So there's a way you can draw a cube on the screen. You just have that function. How are you going to move that cube around? So right now it's rotating around. How are we going to move it instead? Anyone have any ideas? That's good. OK, this guy has some ideas. Go. Okay, all he said was, have a variable to specify the position, and rather than using that variable to rotate, use it to translate, to move, right? So we're going we're gonna to live code this together, and I'm going to copy exactly what he said. There's a function here called rotate. I'm commenting it out right now. I'm going to move the X rot, and I'm going to move that Y rot into the translate. I'm going to save it. Sorry, yep. 
I saved the wrong file. Sorry, guys. Okay, I've saved it now. Do you think it's going to work? Yo, you said it. Yeah? Okay, so we're going to go into that. Okay, look, I'm pressing up, I'm pressing down, and it's actually, rather than spinning, it's moving. That's good, this guy. That was easy, right? You just took a cold, now you can move things. So I'm just going to go into my file system really quickly. Okay, there we got the, we got the file open. Now, one of the things you're going to have to handle is you can now use using your genius movement algorithm. The problem we have is you can actually keep on moving forever and ever and ever. So how are we going to limit it to only move in the screen? All we do is we set up some if statements. We say, hey, you can only move five to the right max. If not, you can't do that anymore. So where are we going to add that coded? There's a function called animate, and in a, in a game loop, or in a game engine, or when you're making games, there's something called a game loop. And what that happens is, every single frame, something gets drawn on the screen, and some bit of logic gets inputted. So to do animations, to make things go smoothly, you need to calculate the movement per frame. So if I want to move right, I need to say, move one here, move one here, move one here, Move one here, draw. Move one here, draw. So every single frame, I'm going to be incrementing the value to the right. So in this function called animate, all I've done, I've just said, if the Y position is greater than 1, only allow you to go downwards. Only, only increment the position if the speed is negative. If Y is less than minus 1, for example, if it's hit the bottom of the screen, only allow it to go up. So that's why in this example right now, it stops at the top and it stops at the bottom. So I'm going to jump into a more advanced demo just showing exactly this same source code. And instead of drawing one cube, I'm drawing two cubes. The way I've done that is, inside draw scene, instead of just drawing the entire block or the cube as before, I split it up and I've made a function called draw player. All I've done is copied that bunch of codes that previously existed in draw scene and I've modularized it so I can call it several times. And the X position value and Y position value, rather than it just being a global variable for one person, I've created a class called player. All a class is is just an object type. So I've put an X value and a Y position inside this object type, and I've instantiated. I've created a player one, and I've created a player two. And inside draw scene, I said draw player one, and then draw player two. And it goes ahead and draws, uses the exact same functions we used before to draw two different objects. Now, can anyone tell me why one object is to the right and one object is in the, in the center? This should be easy. Different answer, different answer, gone. You win 500 points if you get this right. Yes, go! Sorry? Well, why, why is one, one box on the right and one box in the middle? Oh, you're getting a microphone. You're going to be famous. Thank Announce you. your Twitter handle. Ah, sorry. I think in the middle is on the right. No? The, the middle one is on the right? No. I, uh, in the middle? Is on the left. Yeah. Um, on the right. Uh, 
seconds. No? Okay, so you think the one's one's been moved? Is that right? Yes. That is that is the answer. That is exactly it. And I'll show you where it's being moved. Here, this line of code, I create a new player, and I set the X position to 15. If I set that to minus 15, refresh, it's now on the left. I can even add in another one. And they should be free now. So you've, you've got your own system for drawing players. Now, we know how to move our character. So this guy can move. But there's a problem. Because unless we do anything, this guy is going to go straight through this, this character, right? So how do we stop them from going through each other? I'm going to tell you. There's this really simple function. It's, it's, it's uh, 2D physics. It's in the most basic function that every single game engine uses. And if you want to get more complicated about things, every single game engine uses this function as a first step to find out if something's collided. If it passes this function, you're good. No, there's no collision. If it fails it, it does a more advanced collision check. Now, all this function does is, it says, is the right side of my player intersecting with the left side of another object? And is the left side of my player intersecting with the right side of another object? If it isn't, that means we're on two different planes. I'm here, and it's somewhere else. But if it is in that same plane, it then says, OK, am I in the same Y space as well? Is my, is my front intersecting with the back of his? And is my back intersecting with the front? Now, I'm really sorry for using the word intersecting, but all it means is just bashing into. I'm going to show you this in action. So I'm going right, and he's stuck there. He's not going to move, even though I'm pressing right. I'm going to go again left. He's stuck there, not going to move. Whereas if I go over on top of him, I can continue going around him. The reason why this happens is, inside the animate function, just like we were doing before where we were adding values on the x and the y position, all I added was, was an if condition. And what I do is I call a function called can move. If it says true, that means I can move and I can add on that value. If it says no, that means I can't move and I won't add it on. And all that function can move does, It goes through my player's array, the list of all the objects that I have in the world. If the object that I'm colliding with, or I'm testing, if the object that I'm testing isn't me, I then get its right position, its left position, its top position, its back position, and I do that if loop. If it collides, it will return false. If it doesn't, it will return true. If you want, I'm going to put this code up on GitHub so you can, you can take it. But it's awesome. Like, these lessons are for free. This is like the start. I know some of you have made some games and respect, respect. But if you have never done a game before, you can, you can make this. You can publish this on the internet. And your friends can be playing it like that. You don't need to go through any compilation, any linking, any deployment. And you can even play it on mobiles. It's insane. In the world of 10 years ago, there was lots of gatekeepers where you could not do this. You can even put in a PayPal thing, and if someone wants to pay you, you know, you might get rich. I don't know what's going on, but... <laughs> now, there is some more things to do. I'm going to tone it down on this section. Unless you guys have questions, which we can go into that later. I'm going to enter in how to make this stuff multiplayer, because I think that's something that would be awesome for us to do. But in order to level up and to make an awesome game out of this, you're going to have to get into the world, if you want to do this, you're going to have to get into the world of loading 3D models. And there's some graphics packages like Blender, 3D Studio Max, Maya. And there's object formats called .obj, .fbx, .3ds. And they're just a bunch of data. 
if you do want to get into this world, you're going to have to figure out what the indexing of the data is and how to pump that data set into your WebGL context. But in the end, at the end of the day, all it is is just a bunch of indices, a bunch of vertices, and a bunch of UVs. But it's just locked up in their proprietary format. Some of them are JSON, some of them XML. FBX isn't, but um, don't worry. There's game engines for you to handle all this for you. But if you learn this stuff, it's going to be awesome. Let's breathe. Let's relax. Let's go. We're going to do some multiplayer stuff now. You guys excited? Has anyone here done any multiplayer games before? Get on the stage. Tell me about your game. <laughs> What's the name of your game? Ace of Spades. Dude, that's like a rock song. It's like famous. <laughs> It's actually oh. woo! Uh, it's a card game <laughs> where you can, uh, using JavaScript, uh, define the rules of any card game using the standard 52 cards. And uh, basically, when you define the rules, you can play it. Multiplayer, can single player, anything. Can I just clarify? Because I don't know if you're trolling me or you're being genuine. <laughs> is this, is this a, a, virtu a video game or is it a real game with your friends? Uh, it's, it a video, it's a video game okay. made in Java. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> Can we download that? Do you want to advertise it? Shout it out? Well, uh, it's a bit buggy. <laughs> <laughs> Very buggy. Especially the multiplayer part. Um, well, Have you considered going to sales? <laughs> this guy did it with me. And he's really ashamed because Don't it's buggy. Him into it. <laughs> okay, anyone else wants to embarrass themselves in this crowd? Okay, it's fine. Don't have to. We'll have a time to go over this later. Now, in the world of HTML5, just like I talked about WebGL, there's something else. It's called WebSockets and WebRTC. These two libraries, they're good, they're emergent, they allow you to go multiplayer, but the big problem with them is you can't really use them on mobiles because the awesome telecom operators they they hate multiplayer stuff and they hate persistent connections so they constantly cut you off and they introduce delays so if you're trying to go over 3g or edge you're in trouble maybe on the new 4g spectrum it could be more compatible but it eats up a lot of battery life and you get a lot of problems if you enter this world but the basic protocol what it gives you is an api where you just say new WebSocket, you point it to wherever your server is when you connect, it gives you a callback saying that we're now open and you can send the message to the server. When the server receives that message, he can go ahead and propagate that message to a certain player and he can send it back to you. We're going to go over this again, but it's going to be easier this time because there's a popular multiplayer stack. Now, HTML5 and Game Dev, it's very new. And the good thing about HTML5 and Game Dev is it's an unexplored territory. You've got companies like Google, you've got companies like Microsoft, and you've got companies like Google. <laughs> and they haven't conquered HTML5. They don't know what to do with it. They're trying to explore it. And the good thing about this is you guys can conquer it. You guys can figure it out because there is, no market, there is no one marketplace for HTML5 games right now. You guys can solve it. I mean, social networking was solved by Mark Zuckerberg, a teenager. PCs were solved by Bill Gates, a teenager at the time. You got Apple, their founder was a teenager. So this is a good time for you guys. You don't have to be teenagers. That's just optional if you're lucky. <laughs> now, there's this popular multiplayer stack. I mean, this guy's a teenager, so maybe you can do it. Okay, popular multiplayer stack. This one is in an open source um, GitHub project. It was also um, talked through in a talk about two years ago in Google I.O. It's called Greats, and a lot of people use it as well. It uses a stack called MongoDB, Node.js, Socket.io, and you have your WebGL app. Has anyone heard of MongoDB before? One guy, okay. You don't need to know too much about it, but... It's a database, and I know if you guys are looking into games, you probably hate databases. This one is, is kind of all right because, well, for rapid prototyping, it's really nice because it supports JSON format. If you don't know what JSON format is, it's just a very easy way to just send in and out data. 
reason why you need a database or some sort of file system is to persist your data. For example, if you have a high score table and I'm the high score, as soon as I reset that server, the high scores are lost unless you save that high score list onto your computer. That's why you need a database. Node.js, has anyone heard of Node.js? We got a couple of guys at Node.js now, now. Respect, that's awesome. I was programming in a language called JavaScript and I was doing it on the web. Node.js allows you to reuse JavaScript on the server. So just as easy and as quick as it was for me to make changes in this world, here where I'm draw player, I commented it out, I just hit refresh and it's gone. Just as easy as I can do that, you can do that now on the server side. You don't need to worry about deployment of Java servlets and all these like complicated, archaic craziness. And PHP, I mean, it sports WebSockets now, but it's not really built for persistent connections. But Node.js is beautiful. We're going to show you how to do that. And there's something called Socket.io. Now, I was complaining a bit about WebSockets before. Socket.io, there's other libraries. There's something called Socks.js, but all it is is a wrapper library. It's got a really simple API, open, close message, and it wraps web sockets, it wraps flash sockets, it wraps long polling. So you pretty much don't need to worry about if your mobile phone supports it or not. It will just pick the best one for you. So it's very easy to get up and running quickly. So on your Node.js server, there's a function called socket.io. Now on the client, all I say is just like in WebSockets before, I say IO connect and I give it a server URL. And then it will send me a connected message when the server acknowledges that. And that server side message will have your user ID. On the server, the user ID is just the number one. Whenever another player joins in, it gets incremented to number two, number three. And when you shoot, all you do is tell the server, hey, I want to shoot at another user ID. This probably is a bit hardcore, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into an actual live project. To, sh to sh flesh it out and show you how, how easy it is. Now, this is a, a, a real life multiplayer server. It's probably proprietary, but it's cool. You guys can use it. On the server, it's saying listen, and it's listening on a port. So on the server, you just say listen on port 80 or port 81, any number between zero and the thousands that you can do. The best one is port 80 or 8080 because they're not blocked by the networks by default. But if you get into the ropey ones, they think you're a Trojan virus or something. So it's just now listening for people connecting. Whenever a connection is made, he's given an object called socket. So all he does there is he gives that socket a session ID and then he sends that session ID using the emit function to the client. On the client, IO connect, he's connected to the server. When he receives that connected message, he now has his session ID. And now that he's got his session ID, he can then shoot at. So before, I was pressing right to move right. Now I can have it, when I press space, I can emit that socket to the server and the server will then send that message to all the connected clients. And once they, they receive that message, they can re-simulate that message. So I'll give you an example. I shoot in my, my game. I send that shoot message to the server. The server tells the other player that I have shot. So inside the game, I'm recreating that shooting event. Probably not doing the best of jobs explaining this, but don't worry, guys. This code is, is open source. There's a, a demo that goes along with this. There's a really good um, Node.js 
sorry, I don't have the internet. The, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it out later. There's a really good free Node.js server that you can use remotely, and you just upload your JavaScript file to it, and that can be your server. And on the client, you just connect to that IP address. I'll, I'll send it off as, as part of this um, connection. So continuing on the shooting, when you receive it on the client, just like I did before in the second player, he will receive a shoot message on the server, and then he'll just emit that shoot suit message to all the clients. So the server just has a list of connections. He receives a, a shoot message from one client, and he tells all the other clients that that client has shot, and then they replay it. Any questions? It's probably a bit ropey. You guys get it? It's just very, very basic messaging. I tell one guy, and he goes ahead and do it. Now, there's, there is some to-do stuff to worry about, but if you're just getting up and running with multiplayer, don't worry about it too much. There's stuff like load balancing, there's stuff like latencies, and there's stuff like server-side validation. And I'll just quickly mention that. When you have one server node, he can only handle a certain amount of connections. So what you're going to have to do is, if your game becomes meteoric, like that guy's Ace of Spades, you're going to have to set up several server nodes. And each server node can only handle a certain amount. So you're going to have to do stuff like, if it gets complicated, limit the amount of connections each server can go in. And a good way to go about this is limit it geographically. So just say you have a virtual game map. If a player is in the left side of the map, and that map is packed out, all the players on the left side of the map will run on one server. If the player moves to the right a bit, he will now transfer from that server to this server, because he'll only see the players in this vicinity. If he moves right a bit more, he'll now be on this server. And just like real life human traffic, if one area gets too complicated, too populated, you can't actually physically move there. So it makes sense. And there's some subdivision hacks or techniques called octrees that's very, very prolificated inside client-side development. You can use the exact same way inside servers. Big thing you're going to worry about, though, is latency. Now, not everyone has awesome Wi-Fi connection like this. O2 Arena place. No Wi-Fi, OK. Some people are on Edge. Some people are on, um, on 3Gs. Everyone's on different ratios. So you really need to think carefully about how you're going to simulate the game. You can't just say, I'm here, I'm in this XY position, and I'm shooting in this XY position. You're going to have to be a bit clever. And one of the popular techniques to get around this is, rather than just saying, I'm here, and he's here, shoot in this direction, and when he receives the message, just say five seconds later, he could have moved over here. So a good, good way to get around this is, rather than saying, shoot in this direction, say, validate it, and then say, shoot at that player. And then in this game world, no matter where he's actually moved off to, he's going to try shooting at you. And no matter where you are, you're going to try shooting at him. Are we okay for time? Sure? Okay. Probably a bit too much. Um, don't worry, guys. There is help for you guys. You don't actually need to learn any of this. There's some really amazing frameworks. This is like the hard, th th that was the hardest core ever programming you'd get to do in your life if you wanted to go down. I mean, you could get harder, of course, like NASA or something. Not N A S A. N -S -A <laughs> There's stuff like FreeJS, it's like the most popular JavaScript graphics library. And what that does is it gives you an easier API to do some awesome 3D graphics, to do some animations, to do some post-processing post effects for you. There's a really wonderful British startup called Play Canvas. They're making a really awesome 3D editor for making games, and they have a really great first-person shooter demo to use. There's these guys up in America that I met called Clay.io. They're making a, an app store for HTML5 games. Some awesome cool guys, I think they're in Romania, called Gameleon. They're making a map editor for 2D. I probably s s said too much about hardcore stuff. I'm going to open up to a couple of questions before going into how to make this stuff work on mobiles. If you guys want to know. Anyone have any questions, maybe? Don't be shy. Like, if you want to advertise your game, shout it out. You can ask anything. You can scratch your hair and pretend to ask something if you don't. 
I will give you my t-shirt if you ask something. Okay. Yeah, okay, so. this guy, you're not actually getting my t-shirt. <laughs> I'm uh, in my university, but um, we're planning to make a, a freemium gamer like for Penrose Market. That's a work on, yes, we're planning to put on an Android. Android. Do you know how to um, like make objects to, p to buy? You know, like freemium games, you need like, some extra levels like, to sell. Do you know how to um, make those like levels available so players can buy them to apply to freemium games? Yeah, I mean, does, does anyone want to answer this question? I'm opening up to the crowd. Yeah, um, if if you if you sell something as a the freemium model just allows you to sell, you give away the game for free, and then you can sell any product you want for either a chargeable item or a rechargeable item. What, what a once-off item is, you unlock it and it's yours forever. A rechargeable item is, for example, gold, co gold coins or gas. Something that the player re reuses over and over again. The, the Google Play Store, they allow um, consumable items and non-consumable items, just like the Windows Phone Store. The iOS Store also supports that, um, that ethos as well. I, I know on, on the Windows Phone Store, you, once you consume an item, you say that it's consumed. On Android, it's the exact same thing. So easiest way to do it is as soon as you receive a, an item yep. you consume it straight away so the Google Play Store mm -hmm. thinks that it's been consumed but you save it on your database yeah. that you still have the item to still use mm -hmm. now that's very very good because that means you do less work talking to Google Play yeah but it's um, if you don't handle that client correctly mm -hmm. if you for example if he deletes the game and reinstalls it he's now lost that money so make sure if you're going to do that technique to save it on the cloud as well. So if they download it again, mm -hmm. they, can, they know that they still have a consumable item that they can use. But if you don't consume it straight away, you can, go, you can keep on asking the Windows Phone APIs. You can still ask, keep on asking the Windows Google, uh, sorry, the Google Play APIs to consume it for you again. And they'll keep a record of that. Yeah. I personally manage it myself because I'm a bit mm -hmm. into that stuff. But yeah, Google Play supports it just like the iOS supports it as well. Oh, Good question. Whoa. Nothing to do with the content we covered. <laughs> so we can have maybe one more question before I dive into this and then we're, we're going to... It could be about anything. Oh, we got a hand over there? Don't you... D d no? Fine. We'll go over to the next section. Now this is a bit hardcore. HTML5 is awesome because it allows you to write once and run anywhere. The problem with HTML5 is though, hey, Deanne, question. <laughs> question. You have a question for me? No, you're going to ask me a question. <laughs> I got a friend in the crowd. <laughs> oh my God, Mozilla are just the best people in the history of the world. She's from Mozilla, okay. <laughs> okay, HTML5 is awesome. Like, you can write once and you can run it anywhere. The problem is though, it runs slow on mobile phones. Has everyone, anyone here ever tried writing an HTML5 app on a mobile? The guy in the back, shout out your experience. Was it good? Was it awesome? Was it rubbish? Okay, for the benefit of those without super hearing, he said it's a bit slow. So if you want to do 3D graphics, if you want to do anything a bit awesome, it's a nightmare because you, you, you have so much fun on your computer with the, with the quad-core processor and then you go on your, your, your HTC, okay, it also has a quad-core processor but it just runs a lot slower. <laughs> if you want to get into the world where it runs super fast, you need to be clever and there's something called proxies and there's something called wrapping and basically you need to get into the world of hybrid engines. The way hybrid engines work is, it's a mixture between C++ and JavaScript. What you do is, ah, I know you as well. If you've got a question, you can shout out. I appreciate it. <laughs> In, inside the world of JavaScript, that's where you write everything, what your camera is going to do, what the game object loop is going to do. But whenever he makes a WebGL call, rather than making that WebGL call, he's going to go through a JavaScript proxy function who's going to translate that WebGL call into a string saying, draw something 3D. 
that draws something 3D is going to translate that into C++. And C++ is going to pick it up, read that string, and say, hey, there's something 3D that I need to draw. He's then going to go to either, depending on the device you're on, the Android renderer, the iOS renderer, or the Windows phone renderer. On Android and iOS, it's very, very compatible because they both use OpenGL. So you can take a WebGL call, translate it, and use it in OpenGL. Inside um, Windows Phone, you need to use Direct3D. So you need to translate OpenGL into Direct3D. But if you get this done, you've got a really super fast way of writing JavaScript that runs on any device. And I've got a present for you. There is, there is a couple of solutions that do this. There's something called Titanium. There's uh, another one called, um, I forget the name of them. I, I met them, though. And they're all closed platforms, but there's one open source one. So you guys, if you want, if check it out on source. This is the one that I'm working with. It's called Player. The source code is open. It's free. You guys can use it. You can hack it. You can do whatever you want. You can study from it. The use case I want to show you if you have this architecture, what you can do is, is as follows. Hopefully it will work. Ah, cool, this ran. Okay, so on the right, I have an iOS application. And on the left, I'm in an editor mode. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to jump into the editor mode on the left. Now, this application is World of Fighters. It's on the App Store. If you, you go on your phones, you'll see this change. I'm going to start hacking away at this screen. And it's changed the actual live running store. You didn't need to go for an app update. You didn't need to do anything. Instantly, it's changed. Move over here. It's now changed as well. I'm going to go into this screen. character select. And again, I can change it. I can move it around. And live, I'm modifying a native application. And what's even cooler is I can even jump into the source code. So I'm, I don't know what I'm doing because I'm, I'm just hacking live. But um, maybe select your fighter. Where's that? Select character bunny. OK, so that bunny rabbit there, I'm going to comment him out. I'm going to save it. It's not only updated the visual editor, it's, only, it's actually updated a live iOS code. Now, if you want to get into this, this is open source. You can hack it around. And a good use case for this is you want to sell stuff on your store. OK, how long is it going to take you for sales to, sell, to make that change to sell something on the store? So you need to stop. You need to say, I want to sell this item instead. You need to compile it. You need to build it. You need to link it. You need to test it. You need to publish it over to Google Play. You need to wait a day for it to go on the, the store. And you need to wait a couple of months for the user to accept it. With this infrastructure, if you have a new item to sell, you can immediately sell it straight away. You can even do real-time A-B split testing. Funnel 10 users to try out this item, 10 users to try out that item. Whichever one gets the most buys, it will automatically, in real time, instantly update it. And you could be selling that. You can optimize the monetization of your freemium games like that. So this stuff, if you want to get into it, if you hire some engine guys or get this open source project, you do some amazing technology. We have a workshop today at 2 to 4 PM. It's going to be more graphics oriented, as in making art assets. So we have the awesome MD of Hamilton Kid. Now, this guy has been nominated for BAFTAs, and he works with the most amazing people in the history of the world. BBC, right? Yeah, he's standing right there. We got 3DEL.co.uk. Now, she's beautiful. She's amazing. Got Foizel Hosan. His, um, his app was um, featured by Facebook and the police in a good way. <laughs> and we've got APM Designs, a big open source advocate, and also me. We're going to be showing you how to texture, how to make art, how to make 3D animations using open source software as well as um, um, premium software. And we're going to be showing you how to get that into live running mobile games like that. Thank you um, very much for your time. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Oh, done.
dance. No, I'm done. I'm <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to sh Okay, one. Qu okay, sorry. I have two questions. Yes, yeah, please harass me. Go. So uh, they are close together. Um, you showed a, a quick way to update uh, the code of our game, um, and it's great to to create content that can be sold, and then you can update it. But doesn't that get you kicked out of uh, Apple? <laughs> I love you, man. I, I <laughs> honestly, honestly, the thing is, everyone thinks that. Everyone thinks that Apple hates you. Honestly, they they mm -hmm. think like if I make an application, the best application in the world, hashtag true story, mm -hmm. Apple's gonna say no. I don't like you. It's got a star on it. You're rejected. Thing is, Google Play don't allow you to update native applications. Mm -hmm. If you mess around with the APK, just like Facebook did, they'll disallow it. They'll disallow you and. The new, uh, the new um, Google Play policies, you're not allowed to do that. Apple, again, don't allow you to modify um, um, the, the, the package. Again, the C++ code. The reason why they do this is because it's a big security risk to modify native code because you can start hacking into the memory and stealing data and, and totally messing up the system. What they do allow you is to run JavaScript using their... Um, either you can use jobs like an, a JavaScript library or you can use the native ones that's inside a web view. So some of the tricks that th 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 these people do and, and they allow it is because everything is written in JavaScript and only the hardcore stuff is in C++, the driver level stuff is in C++, Apple, they've actually approved all these applications um, for six months now. They never said anything. They were very happy with it. Talk to them a lot. And as long as you're in the JavaScript world, as long as that's where you're making the changes, there's no security risk on the underlying memory and stealing, so it's, it's completely allowed there. But the problem is um, they, also, they, they are not only worried about the code, but also the content. And so they evaluate your content, and then you're changing it after they evaluate it. So they say it's okay, and then you can just change your game and put porn on it if you want to, and they don't, the, the agreement doesn't allow it. And also... Um, what, what prevents you from changing the code into a way that you can make money without giving them any? Because that's the, their main issue. I've had, I've worked in a, so, so a music website. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer that question yeah. for you. You're completely right. You can change it to do bad things. If they catch you once, like if you use this to do bad things, and they catch you, they're gonna kick you out of the store. They're gonna re revoke your license. But if you make these changes to do good things, like optimize your monetization, that's completely acceptable. Okay. And you can do that anyway. You can have a hack in C++ code, an Objective-Z code, saying if date is greater than two weeks. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the people have been doing this anyway. This is a but uh, that takes me to the other question, which is, um, so we're working in a game to be cross-platform. <laughs> and imagine Strong you... Man. <laughs> Imagine you want to create several objects that you want to sell, but then you want to sell them in a web version, and then when you're in the iOS version, you want to use that, that object. O again, you're selling stuff into a game of iOS and without giving them money. Isn't that a uh, problem? Uh, why do in this system that we have a, a wrapper for in-app purchases? So if you want to make a sale on an Android, it will use Google Play. And they'll have their, I think they take 5%, is that correct? On, on, on iOS, it will use the iOS store to sell your items. On the web, we use PayPal. But then when you play the game in iOS and you're using objects from uh, objects that you bought in another platform, don't they get mad at you? Uh, mad at you? I mean, to, <laughs> to, be, to be honest, that, that is a very, very good question. That, that would need to be figured out and solved. There has been cases where they haven't liked it with big-time publishers. I haven't experienced any of that problems before. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cross-platform games that do cross-sell between iOS and Android. So there's a lot of people doing this, and that is a bit of an unknown. But you're right, this can go into a bad territory if, you, if that is your purpose. Yeah. But if it's just to optimize your, your monetization rates for an iOS application, then you're completely fine. Okay, I think we had one more, and then maybe we'll close up because um, I'm scared that he might ask another hard question. Hi. Uh, What's your name? Where'd you come from? What's your Twitter handle? <laughs> I'm Eva. <laughs> uh, does exist any framework or library which work on Scene Graph? Sync. I have I have seen them. There's there's one called um, 
open. Uh, Sorry, if I if I could Google it, I would totally give you. But yeah, Singraph is very very popular. I mean, Java, yeah. uh, they use the, they use Singraph mm -hmm. for Java 3D. Well, I, I use JMonkey Engine for example. Uh, it works on uh, Singraph, but it's for desktop. I think I'm gonna have I'm gonna have to get back to you on there. But I have seen it. There, there's a really popular one. I forget its name though. I'm really sorry. But I have okay. to get follow me on Twitter. Tweet me, tweet me, and I'll answer you it. Okay. Well. What's my Twitter? Uh, but I will also be on the uh, workshop. So okay, perfect. Hopefully, I'll get instant access. Then we'll go. Okay, thank you. Time out. Peace. One more, or we're good. Okay, we're done. Woo!